just want to invite Pastor Fizeme to come up and give us the benediction because there's really not a whole lot else to say at this moment. <sighs> I apologize if I, my energy is a little lower today. Yesterday was my 25th high school reunion. Graduated from Allen High School, William Allen High School, in 1990, down in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And yesterday we gathered together at 5 p.m. and partied till the break of break at 10 p.m. because we're 43 now. We can't go all night like when we were in high school. It's 25 years of high school reunion. Um, and it was just amazing to, to catch. I got to say, as a class, we aged really well. We all look amazing and fabulous. Thank you for that. Thank you, Sherry. I'm going to get one amen if it, that's all I get. And you know, and you have, when you go to a high school reunion, you have that same conversation over and over and over again. How are you? Well, first it is, who are you? Because I had a graduating class of like 500 people. So there's a pretty good chance I didn't know the people that I was meeting that day. And um, we didn't have name tags which had our high school graduation pictures on them. So, you know, a lot of the conversation started with, hey, check name tag, Joe, how you doing, man? You look great. You know, a lot of those moments. Um, and then you catch up and you're, you're talking about family, what you've done over the past 25 years, and how many kids you have, who's married, who's divorced, what's going on, where are you working? And uh, William Allen has actually produced some very, Allentown has produced some titans of industry. Lee Iacocca, the former head of Chrysler, graduated from William Allen High School uh, back in the 50s, I think it was. And I found other friends who have gone on to do, you know, really good things in very big and important companies around the world. And the things you start talking about are the perks. You know, what are the perks you have as you are on your job because a lot of people are looking for those great perks when they're out hunting for a job. And people would hear that I'm a pastor and they'd say, oh, well, there's no perks for you. And I'm like, it's kind of true, but not entirely true. What do you get on your job? And so I had friends and they, I, I, amazing things. And I went through and I confirmed these. So if you, I had a friend who works at SC Johnson and Son. They're the guys who make uh, Pledge and Blade and Windex and all that kind of stuff. They have an on-site concierge at their offices. So if you need someone to go get your groceries, you go to the concierge and you say, these are the, this is my grocery list, go get these groceries. If you need a package picked up or mailed, you need flowers sent out. If you want to get a deal on cart, if you want someone to go stand in line for you to get concert tickets, you need to work at SC Johnson & Son because they'll send the person to... So anyone who's working there, if you want tickets to go see Shakespeare in the Park, tell your concierge, go stand downtown for me so I can get those tickets. Some of you may have seen this, this is confirmed a uh, friend who worked for Netflix now. Unlimited, unlimited maternity and paternity leave for the people who work at Netflix. Unbelievable, unlimited maternity and paternity. One guy who was really smart is continuing to show that the nerds will rule the world one day. Guy who works at Google, of course, all of the work, you know, free lunch, free dinner. They will change your oil, wash your car, give you $12,000 in tuition reimbursements if you want to go to school. But one friend who worked out in San Francisco, he was working for the best company want to work for. It's called Betagram. Betagram. If you've ever heard the phrase, the customer is always right, this is live at Betabrand. Betabrand is, I checked their website, they describe themselves as a crowdfunding clothing community. So they come up with designs for their clothing and they put them up on the website. And then people contribute and say, no, I want the collar to look like this, I want the sleeves to look like this. So the final product that actually gets developed has been crowdsourced to say, this is what we want it to look like. Beta brand will give you completely free vacations which are absolutely unrelated to the work that you do. 
because they put everything on the company credit card and gather up points and then divvy it out among the people who work there. You wanna go away for six months? Go away for six months. We've got you covered. Now, if that sounds interesting to you, you want that kind of like, you hear that, you go, that's the company I wanna work for. Those are the perks that I want. Let me warn you, because if you're going out hunting for a job based upon the perks that you're going to get, chances are you're going to fail at that job. If you go out looking for work based on the perks that the company is going to give you, you are going to fail at that job. Why? Because leaders fail when they focus on their perks and forget their purpose. Leaders fail when they focus on perks and forget purpose. Our scripture reading for today is coming from Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. If everybody could turn there, please. Proverbs 31. Now, usually when we go to Proverbs 31, we're talking about that most excellent woman that's talked about at the end of that chapter. But there is a set of verses in the beginning. If everybody could please stand for the reading of God's word. Proverbs 31. If you have it, say amen. Amen. Okay. The sayings of King Lemuel, an oracle his mother taught him. O oh my son, O oh son of my womb, O oh son of my vows, do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, O oh Lemuel, not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what the law decrees, and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. For the rights of all, for the rights of all who are destitute, speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Let's pray. Father, we are blessed to be in front of your word today, and Lord, I ask that you would Give me continued wisdom in presenting this word to your people. Lord, may we have the wisdom and the grace of the Spirit to hear this word and apply it to our lives. And Lord, we ask for your blessing upon our time. Amen. You may be seated. So King Lemuel. We really don't know who King Lemuel was. He's not one of the kings of, of Israel. Um, and history books of that period, the, the writings of that time, make no mention of a King Lemuel. We can guess that he is royalty, he's referred to as a king. Um, we can also guess from, you can't read, see this in the English translation, obviously, but there are a number of words in here which appear to be Arabic in their origin. So he may have been a king from outside of Israel who had access to, was coming into Israel, was becoming a Jew, something along those lines. Whatever it was, somewhere along the line, his mom sat him down for a conversation. And his mom sat him down for a conversation about what he was supposed to do as king. And that conversation made it into the scriptures. Maybe Solomon overheard, maybe Solomon had a conversation with this king and said, you know what, that's really good stuff. I'm going to write this down. Who taught you that? My mom said that to me. That makes sense. Let me write that down. This is an oracle from his mother. So the conversation, we, we could see from the beginning how his mom really loves him. I mean, look at how she starts here. This sounds so motherly. You know, this, look at how she builds this up so that you'll pay attention to what's about to be said. Oh, my son. Oh, son of my womb. Oh, son of my vows. I mean, the way that moms put the guilt on you to, I bore you. You were with me for nine months in the heat of the summer. I had swelled ankles. Labor lasted for 14 hours. I carried you. I did everything for you. Oh, son of my womb, son of my promise. And, and you hear that, that sense of good motherly guilt to get a child to listen to them. Right? Because if you are a parent, you've used this on your child. 
And if you're a child, your mother or father has used this on you. Pay attention. If you listen to nothing else I say, listen to this, because after all I've done for you, you owe me five minutes. After all I've done for you, you owe me five minutes. You know, she seems to talk about Lemuel as if he's a child of promise, kind of like Samuel was. You know, oh, the answer to my prayers, as he's listed here. Answer to my prayers, answer to my vows, the son of my womb. And when Lemuel's mother has an opportunity to speak with the king about either the duties he's about to inherit, the duties he is currently overseeing, whatever it is that she's about to say, she gets a chance to sit with him, and she starts at a particular place. And she warns him. She warns him, do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. The warning here is one which is a good warning for the kings of Israel in general and the people of the world as a whole. When we are pursuing unrestrained sexual gratification, we are putting ourselves in a dangerous place. When we allow our bodies to dictate what it is that we're going to be spending our time and our energy on, we are making a choice about how to give ourselves and our time to other people. Now she's not arguing for celibacy here per se. She's not saying, look, don't have sexual relationships at all. She's saying, look, you have a queen, all right? That's the one. But a king with the power that kings had at the time, I and mean, we think about Solomon, what did Solomon do? A thousand wives and concubines were with him. What did David do when he had opportunity? You think about what abuse of power means in your pursuit. Think about how in the workplace that we know of, how many people have been forced into having sexual relationships with a boss or a co-worker because of the authority that that person had over them. You know, we talk about sometimes, I, I come out of the, the acting world, we, we talk, it's a joke, but it it's, was very real and it still continues to be. The idea of the casting couch. You want to get a role? You better sleep with your producer. You better sleep with your director. You better sleep with the casting director. You need to do these things because those people have authority over you. Those people have control over your lives. This is still going on today. There was an incredible article um, in Vanity Fair. I put it up on our Facebook page just over the past couple of weeks. Just, I think it was just last week, talking about how the current 20-somethings, people who are getting out of college, entering into the workforce, and their use of apps like Twitter, uh, use of apps like Tinder and Hangin and other dating apps, OkCupid, okay and the mentality that begins to be fed into people because it's just the idea, especially as they talked about for guys, was this idea that women are just another thing to be swiped to the side. You know, yes, 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 I'll, I'll hook up with you, I'll be with you, I'll do, that, I'll do that. There's no intimacy, there's no connection, there's no love there. And that sense of power, in a sense, and liberation. You know, we talk about power and liberation that we, and women are using it too. You know, women are going crazy, some of them, with, with hooking up with dozens. I mean, literally, the article talked about people hooking up with dozens, even hundreds of people over the course of a month. Because all that people are now is a swipe to the right to say, yes, I'll meet with you. Yes, I got 10 minutes. Yes, I'll see you in 15. Yes, we can meet here. My wife is out. This person is out. The com and what is talked about in the article was the complete sense that people have of a loss of romance. People simply have no idea. Where you see people gather around a table at a bar, they're there with their friends, but they're buried in their cell phones. They're there, they could be with a human being, but they're more focused on the app that they can swipe to the left and swipe to the right. It got to the point where the, there was a college professor who offered extra credit to people taking her media class if they went out on a traditional date. I will give you extra credit if you go to dinner and a movie alone with one other person and talk to one another. That's worth extra credit these days. That's where our society has gone. Selfish lust and desire 
compromise our purpose. We talked about David, we talked about Solomon, and in my high school reunion last night, I can't tell you how many times I had the conversation with someone where they said, I said, well, what's your family like? Oh, I've got a couple of kids. Oh, how long have you been married? I'm divorced now. We were married, but he, she cheated. He or she walked away. He or she decided to pursue someone else. He or she gave their heart to. You know, when we sit, I mean, we, we sit in an area, we look around and we can see the effect of, of broken homes and people compromising the love that they're supposed to have for their spouse. And that is the warning that Lemuel's mother is giving him right here. You're a king. You're in a place of extreme power and authority. And not only do you have that authority above others, but people will pursue you in an effort to try to get to you so that they can use that power and authority for themselves. Don't give in to it. There is a strength and a vigor that she talks about here to, that should not be spent on women and those things that ruin kings. Why? Because that strength and that vigor should be used to make him a great king. When you allow the lusts and the passions of your body to overcome the purpose for which God has called you, that is energy that cannot be spent on the things that God has called you to. And if you have a sensitive heart in the Lord, you will, after that moment of compromise, you will feel guilt-ridden and weighted down by what it is that you've done, and it will make it even harder for you to do the things of God. Because now you have to expend energy just to remember that you're fulfilled in Christ, that those things are wrong, and that swirl that goes on in your head of the tape that keeps playing about, I did wrong, God can't forgive me. I did wrong, God can't forgive me. I did wrong, God can't forgive me. When if you hadn't done it in the first place, if the strength and vigor had not been put there, you wouldn't be in that moment at that moment. She's saying, stop it before you start it. Stop it before you start it. Do not get involved in palace intrigue, in the sexual liaisons that are a part of the world around you. Don't do it. Use good judgment. Use wisdom. Use your energy for the purpose for which you have been called, for the purpose for which God has given you an ordained plan and way to go. Our following thought trails on that. It hooks into it. She says, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer. And that's, you know, to me, this is such, this, this strikes me as one of, in the scriptures sometimes, there are these great moments of incredible realism, right? So I'm picturing Lemuel is sitting there with his mom. She says, honey, something we got to talk about. He says, mom, I'm going to listen. She starts off. Don't go hooking up with every little floozy that's walking through the palace. Lemuel begins to turn away and walk away, which is what makes her go, it is not for kings, O Lemuel. Hey, it's not for kings, Lemuel. Look over here, right? Because you know when you hear that word that's telling you not to, your heart starts to go, I'm not even going to listen to this. But mom knows, I got to call you back. I got to call you back. It's not for kings, Lemuel. Hey, don't turn away from me. Come back here. It's not for kings, Lemuel. Listen to what I'm about to say. It's not for kings to drink wine. It's not for rulers to crave beer. Why? Well, it's not a wor warning about using excessive drink because of the foolishness you're going to get into or because some bad Instagram photos of you are going to pop up on the web in a minute. It's a warning because of injustice or the fact that the king is supposed to pursue justice. The warning is against drinking wine, alcohol, things that compromise your mind. We, we could add in heroin, cocaine, marijuana. We could add in all of those things into this grouping right here. Because everyone in this day drank wine. Like, that was the drink. You couldn't get water all the time, but you could grow grapes. Everybody was drinking wine. The warning is to drinking it in excess so that it compromises. Hear how... Now, I'm not saying that this reminded me of my college days, but listen to what is said in Proverbs 23. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? 
Who has, I love this, who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but if you've ever been drunk in your life, these next words will ring very true. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind will imagine confusing things. You will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? My honest excuse is that in college I wasn't a Christian. And I'm not saying I ever got into a drunken fight, but if I had ever gotten into a drunken fight, that idea of he punched me and I don't feel it, so I'm good for another round is absolutely true. That idea of I've passed out and the first thing I think of when I wake up from passing out is I need another glass of whatever it was I may have possibly been drinking a moment before. The power of the substances that are in the world that can confuse our mind and pull us off of the purpose for which God has called us are immense. And when we give ourselves over to them, when we forget that those who linger, I mean, I love that word there, those who linger over wine, those who sit there and enjoy it, and then enjoy it again, and then enjoy it again, and then enjoy it again, so far to the point that their minds are not theirs anymore. They have no control over their bodies. Who forget that in the end, just like the proverb said, it bites like a snake and it poisons like a viper. The challenge here is that when we allow those things to come into our mind, we forget the things that we're supposed to do. Forgetting what has been decreed is what she says. Are those rules that are already in place. There are things that God has said and God has put in our path, that God has put in the word for us to take in, for us to understand, and for us to apply. And when we drink, when we use, when we use materials that cloud our judgment, that cloud our thinking, the first thing to go is common sense. Restraint. The sense that I shouldn't do this again. I shouldn't do this anymore. You say that the next morning. You wake up, God, I will never, ever, ever do that again. If you please get rid of this headache. I promise you, it will never happen again. Oh, look, it's someone from Tinder. I guess I'm going to a bar tonight. Right? We forget that quickly. We forget that quickly. He's saying, don't get involved with it. Don't let it start clouding your judgment because it's a downward spiral. You're going to keep falling further and further down. The responsibility of the king is to speak for the poor since they have no one of any other strength to speak on their behalf. The plight of the poor today is the plight of the poor a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, four thousand years ago. The poor are trampled on. The oppressed of our world are walked over and stepped on by those who are powerful. That's the dynamic. And it's going to be that way until the Lord returns. It is the responsibility of those in leadership to secure and hold true the rights and the privileges of the poor so they are not just cogs in the machine and not just victims of society. When we allow ourselves to be distracted from the purpose for which God has called us, by the benefits of fulfilling that call, we fall into a trap. It's okay for the king to drink. It's okay for the king to have a party. It is okay for the king to get married. 
but it's wrong for the king to abuse that so the parties turn into bacchanals and festivals that go on for days which are just licentious and rude and pornographic. It is wrong for the king to abuse his power. It is wrong for the president to abuse his power. It's wrong for the mayor to abuse his power. It's wrong for the police to abuse their power. It's wrong for the pastors to abuse their power. It's wrong for you to abuse your power. You all sit in positions of leadership. It's on your job, it's in your house, it's in your family. You are all in positions of leadership. And there are opportunities you have, even as students, to abuse the power that God has put into your hands. If you do that once, it is so tempting to do it again. I got away with it. No one said anything to me, or they were too scared to say anything to me. So I'm going to do it again. Watch yourself. Be careful. Don't compromise your virtue because of what you can gain for this world. Lay up your treasure in heaven. Don't look at what you can get right here. That abuse of power is like a, like a Chinese finger trap. You ever had a, a Chinese finger trap? If you've never had one, go down to Chinatown, they're like a penny. All right? And what you do is you put your finger into two little pieces of paper, and they say, pull your fingers apart. You think, it's just a little piece of paper. I can do. But the harder you pull, the more effort you put into pulling, the tighter it becomes and the more you can't. How do you get out of a Chinese finger trap? You stop pulling. You push, and then you slip it off. The more that we indulge, the more energy we put in our, to our desire, the more we forget the purpose for which God has called us. We have a purpose, we have a reason for being here, and when we compromise ourselves, we forget that purpose. She uses that moment here of talking about that downward spiral to talk about, sarcastically, the way that people sometimes focus on the poor. Give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery once more. She's being here sarcastic because the idea is, hey, look, people are suffering, let them go and um, drown their sorrows in whatever substance they can find. And we all know people who have started that downward spiral, who have hit a rough patch, who have used drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever it is, as something to try to comfort their soul. Something to try to make them feel better. So they thought, if I can just have another drink, the problems will go away. If I can just get high again, I'm going to be a much better. If I can slay one or two more people in the bed, I'm going to be great. I'm going to have my self-esteem back. I'm going to feel good about myself. She's saying that's what people say, but that's not true. That's not the way to go. How do we know? Well, Proverbs is covered from beginning to end about the foolishness of using substances to overcome your internal strife. Proverbs 21, 20 verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. That's how we know what she's saying here is not to be taken literally. She's not saying, look, give drugs to the people who are suffering just so they don't think about it. What she's saying here is, this is what people will say, but that's not what you're supposed to do. How do we know? Because look at what she says in the very next words. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. In verses 8 and 9, she takes all of verses 4 through 7. Verses 4 through 7 are, are negative. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. We get to verses 8 and 9, and she takes that don't do it, and she says, do do this. This is the purpose, O king, for which you are here. Because she sees that power in the hands of the wise is for those who have no power. If you are a wise person, if you are a godly person, the power that you have is so that you can stand by and stand up for those who have no power. It's the difference between what we would usually call cunning and what we would call wisdom. Cunning is for the evil. Cunning is for people who are using God's wisdom for their own selfish gain. 
but the wisdom of God is to be used for the uplifting and the upbuilding of other people. What's interesting about this is that it shows that the king, the leader, is not supposed to be separate from the people. He's supposed to be one of the people so that he is aware of the problems of the people and so that he can stand up for the problems of the people. He is their champion of people who otherwise cannot get a fair hearing. That is his purpose. That is God's purpose for him. Our leadership should not be such that, that anyone has a question as to our motivations. You know, some people, being a pastor, it's, it's a weird set of time commitments. You know, if any of you know people who have worked in the past, or there are families who have worked in the being a pastor is weird. You know, because it is a 24-hour-a-day job. There's phone calls at all kinds of odd hours, and yet we're here in the church sometimes during the day, and then we'll see Bible study at night or something like that. And when you come for Bible study, when, notice what I said, when you come for Bible study on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock in the parlor, I'll say that again for those playing the home version of the game, when you come for Bible study at 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights, we've already been here all day. You're coming to relax, we're continuing our job which we do with joy in our hearts. But because of those odd hours, we can sometimes work in some flexibility to our schedule because we know things shift and, and there are going to be demands at weird hours. If my purpose and my joy in being a pastor is the flexible schedule, I've missed the purpose for which God has called me. The flexible schedule thing, the way that times shift around, just because, look, I've got to get sleep, I've got a family, I've got to watch over, these are things that I've got to do, those aren't the reasons I should be a pastor. The perks on your job are not the reasons you should be on your job. You should be on your job because you actually love your job. And the perks are exactly that, perks. If someone took the perks away, would you still enjoy your job? If not... Evaluate why you're there. Evaluate why you're doing what you're doing. Now, I'm not talking about the regular paycheck kind of thing. But if the only reason that you're doing something is because of the reasons that get you away from doing that very thing, you should have a question about why you're doing that particular job, why you have that particular calling. Being an authority sometimes leads us to the conclusion that we're above the law. When you have a position of leadership, when you have a position of authority, it can lead you to the idea that you are above the law. Think of Nixon and Watergate. The very words that came out of his mouth, the president is above the law. All right? Why do you think Clinton had the affair with Lewinsky? It's very simple. Because he could. Because he could. Because he had that kind of authority. When we take the effects of substances that warp the mind and sexual promiscuity, which feeds the ego, it can turn a leader in every area of our lives. It can take leadership and turn our eyes away from the responsibilities we're supposed to have. The purposes for which God has called us are to make this world beautiful, to make it reflect the kingdom to make it a place to show the grace and the glory and the beauty of God. We should think about heaven. We should look forward to that heavenly rest. But if the only thing we think about is heaven, if the only perk that we think about in being a Christian and a follower of Christ is that which is yet to come, and we don't look at that purpose for which we are here right now, we have missed the purpose for which God has called us. God doesn't save us and take us to heaven. He saves us and leaves us here. There's a reason for that. One day Christ will return. One day Christ will come back. And we should have a bride ready for him that's as beautiful as she possibly can be. That means this world right now, we should be working to make as beautiful as lovely, as gorgeous of a bride for our bridegroom to receive as we possibly can. 
That's your purpose. That is your purpose in Christ. To do good. James 1.27, good religion, what is it? That which cares for widows and orphans in their distress. We should be out there doing right and doing good so that this world is as beautiful as it possibly can be for Christ when he returns. Do not allow the perks of being a Christian and the perks of your places of authority to overcome your purpose in those very same places. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, we are coming before you as a people who need to be reminded of why we are here in this world. Lord, why it is that we are gathered together and not in your presence at this very moment. And so, Father, as we leave here today, could we be a people who even as we are walking down the street see opportunities to make your world, your kingdom greater, and in that purpose, Lord God, to make your bride more beautiful. Lord, would we love one another so that your bride is more beautiful. Lord God, would we care for your creation so that your bride is more beautiful. Lord God, would we do all that we can to make the fullness of the kingdom known so that our purpose is solid and clear in our mind. Lord, would we receive more joy in you so that you would be more glorified in us. In your name we pray. Amen.